incomparably profound and exquisite is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands and millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is day four of this seven-day session here at Hidden Valley Zen Center in Southern California and a very hot day in July 2019. We are now halfway through Sashin. What that means is in the rest of Sashin, you've got a great deal of power and you can go deeper with that power than would have been possible in the first day of Sashin. And it's a result of all the efforts everyone has put into their meditation in the first four days of the Sashin. It is uh, amazing what a concentrated period of Sashin can offer in the way of opening one's mind in very positive ways. Of course, opening one's mind, we also open it to where we are um, invested in uh, appearing in a certain way and feeling certain things and not feeling other things admitting certain things and not admitting other things. And the things that we don't want to own, so to speak, we shut down. We, we try to pretend they don't exist. And yet, what Zazen does is open us up to the whole picture increasingly clearly. And part of that process is to see where we have denied behavior that was less than exemplary, uh, a reaction that we're not comfortable with, and I would put, generally speaking, most for most people, um, being enraged is one of those uh, experiences that is, is too uncomfortable, and hopefully none of you have been in that mind state. Nonetheless, we are all in mind states that we really have not been comfortable in, since the moment we were born. And again, thinking about this little boy who was probably about a year and a half on the airplane uh, between uh, Denver and, San, and um, San Diego, who was quite literally screaming the entire way, the whole two hours. Uh, something was going on for that little boy. He was otherwise quite a charming, handsome little guy but he wanted his way, and his way was not to be buckled into a seat belt. His way was to be wandering the, the aisle, and, and uh, that's not exactly a safe place for anybody to be under certain circumstances, and definitely not for a child that young. So we don't know how this little boy is gonna grow up, but his mother was trying valiantly to um, get him into a different mind state in, in patient and gentle ways, which will be about the best that he could, could hope for, actually. She was trying to model patience, and, and uh, I'm sure she was in some level of agony given how much of a disruption he was creating to the entire airplane for the entire two hours. So whatever happens in our life, we experience it, we draw conclusions about it. And if it's not been a pleasant experience, we try to forget it, try to pretend it doesn't happen, try not to feel the feelings that come up around it. But unfortunately, you can't shut down part of your mind and just keep the pleasant parts. It's all or nothing. And to shut down completely is to dissociate and to live your life more or less as a zombie. Uh, it's interesting that when I was in high school, I was called a zombie by one of the more popular uh, girls in my class. And it was true. I was shut down. But as we go into our Zen practice, we, we begin to open up. And that 
can be disconcerting. It's not comfortable to re-experience unpleasant emotions, difficult memories, and so on. But they do come up. And we have important ways to work with them and, and to free them. The most important way, actually, was taught by the uh, 10th century Tibetan master, Buddhist master, Lon Chimpa. And um, I had meant to print that out today. I'll have to do it later because I didn't do it yet. But essentially, he's saying the same thing that uh, the psychologist Eugene Gendlin discovered when he was a graduate student and did research into why some people uh, are able to proceed swiftly and, and uh, freely through uh, therapy, through psychotherapy. And other people uh, can do it for decades and never deal with their stuff. And wanting to know what the difference was, he quickly discovered that the ones that could freely extricate themselves from pain and suffering through their psychological work, which of course I have to say, it, it goes deep, but it does not go as deep as Zen practice does. And it can free us up to a certain point, and it is important for anyone who's had uh, a challenge in growing up to do a certain level of psycho psychotherapy. It can uh, make things go much quicker in our Zen practice. It can sort of clear out some obstacles before they even maybe arise. But what he discovered was the ones that could free themselves quickly and move on in their therapy was that they were able to tune in to feel the energy of their bodies when they were opening to some difficult material. And he termed this process uh, opening to the felt sense. We're not talking about emotions here, we're talking about the felt sense, the energy. What does the energy in our body feel like? Are we vibrating? Is there uh, heat or cold? Is there some level of tension or a feeling of electricity? These kinds of things, if we are willing to open up to the physical experience of whatever the, the memory or the current event even has, we, we are able to become free of it. And actually, this is exactly what Lon Chempa said in different words. He said something like, uh, at the very moment, a difficult feeling arises. At his first inception, he says, before karma has been created, in other words, before you've started to react to it, remain deeply present with that experience the felt sense of the experience. And in doing so, it's freed in its own place and becomes pure and joyful. And I would add also that it removes any impetus to react. It's, it's incredible. Uh, long ago when Zen came to America, that was prophesized that it would ally itself with psychotherapy. And indeed it has. There's been a few lumps along the way, but um, the two can work well together. It needs to be understood, as I already said, that it, it, psychotherapy cannot replace Zen practice in the depths that Zen practice can enable us to reach. The clarity, the freedom, the enlightenment that we can reach through Zen practice. But it can do a lot to clear the boulders out of the way. And I'd like to share with you now <coughs> something of uh, a poem that
that Hakui was asked to write and wrote uh, in memory of one of the two wealthiest men who lived in the town of Hara, uh, where he was born and raised, and where he ended up teaching at Shoinji. They, this, this man was also a, a patron of Shoinji. It said that the, that the two richest men in the, the, count, the town uh, lived on opposite sides of a river that ran through the town. And uh, one of them, many of you have already heard about, his name was Heishiro, and he was the man who was asked to provide a statue for a park for the town. And he did, and on the day the statue was dedicated, the park was dedicated, he was seated in the place of honor near a waterfall. And he happened to notice that as the water bounced and, and, and <coughs> dropped down the waterfall, it created bubbles. And the bubbles, some of them would pop immediately, some of them would float down a little bit and pop, and eventually all of them popped, no matter how far they floated. Before they did so, they all popped. And somehow, <coughs> this connected for him as a significant reminder that everyone dies. Some die young, some die in middle age, some die at a great old age, but everybody dies. And it struck him deeply. He just couldn't enjoy the party anymore, and so he left. And on the way home, he passed somebody chanting something about a person uh, of deep resolve in one day can come to awakening. And so when he got home, he locked himself in the guest bath, <coughs> which by the way is one of the, one of the uh, sacred places, I think you really could say, of a Japanese temple. There's the Zendo, of course, and there's also the Japanese bath. It's meant to be a place of deep silence and, and deep practice. It's not just about getting clean. In fact, that's probably the lowest of its meanings. So he locked himself in the, in the guest bath and, and sat down and focused his mind. And he didn't know anything about Zazen. He just did what he thought he could. He wasn't trying to do Zazen, he was trying to find out what's gonna happen to him when he dies. And why does he have to die? And he was so absorbed in this question that he sat through the rest of the day, through the night, into the morning, and was sort of brought back to uh, the outside world, so to speak, by the feeling of his, his fingernails digging into his palms. And he felt different. So he decided to continue, and he continued for another day and night. And on the third morning, he got up and looked out the window. Somehow the garden had transformed. He felt, he said, that his eyeballs had fallen out and disappeared, which is interesting because Flora Couture when she had her, her deep awakening experience as a college student at the University of Michigan, felt that her perception had changed its locus, its source. She was no longer looking out of her eyes, out of her head. There was some deeper, different level of perception through which she was living. At any rate, he didn't know what the heck happened. All he knew was that it was just amazing. And so he went to um, a village priest who, who didn't know what had happened to him, he said, but if he went to see Hakuin, 
he would. And so he did go to see Hawk Wings. And he went into Hawk Wings' sons and room. Hawk Wing tested him, gave him some colons, and he passed them. <coughs> Quite thoroughly. And from then on, he continued to be a, a, a student of Hawk Wings. So this other man, there's a description of him. Let me see if I can find it. This is under the title of Explanation of the Dharma Name Daiyu Jitetsu Koji. Koji means uh, lay person, layman actually specifically. And here's uh, what it's about. The man's name was Watanabe Heizayemon Hisachika. And he was a uh, proprietor of a, a, a big inn, the most important inn. I should say something about these inns because Hawk Wing's family also was, were innkeepers. At that period of history in Japan, in order, I'm sure it was calculated, in order to prevent rebellion on the part of the, let's say, the equivalent of the governors of the states. Um, they were required twice a year to come before the, uh, the shogun. And they were required to do so with ceremony and uh, great entourages. So they had jugglers, they had acrobats, they had all kinds. Of, it was a moving show with hundreds of people as part of the entourage, all gathered, all going to support the, the daimyo on his semi-annual travels before the, the shogun. And they passed through uh, Hara and Agwing's family inn served a certain level of those people. I think it was mid-level, it wasn't the highest level of people. It wasn't the daimyo that stayed there. But it sounds like uh, for this, this man who's getting the Dharma name, it was the daimyo that would stay at his inn. And uh, there's a, a book of Hawkwing's art uh, that was written by Professor Yoshizawa uh, in Kyoto, where he, he shares the immense variety of, of the art that Hakuin did, and also, in essence, translates the meanings of it. Because uh, these were political commentaries, some of these works of art. They weren't just calligraphy. They weren't just portraits of Kuan Yin looking like Hakuin. They were, uh, he did some paintings of these processions. So this elderly man has died peacefully and his son has asked um, Hawkwing to provide him with a posthumous name. And so here is what Hawkwing writes about this. Watanabe Heizaemon, Hisachika was a simple, pure-hearted man with a deep and unwavering commitment to the path of Buddha. The wealthy Watanabe family is known throughout the province for their benevolence. Their true worth is found in the accumulation of merciful acts that generations of family members have performed. I gave Hisayamon a Dharma name once before, along with the text of the three refuges to recite for over 1,000 days, he kept incense burning constantly at the family altar and recited the three refuges morning and night, flagging neither in the heat of summer nor the freezing cold of winter. On the 13th of the 10th month of this year, the second of Kyoho, which was 1717, Heizaemon passed away quietly without any suffering. It was surely the result of his many years of compassionate conduct 
His son and heir, Sukya Fuso, came and asked me to write something to explain the meaning of his father's Dharma name. I have written a Chinese verse to elucidate the meaning of the name Dai Yu. Dai Yu means great and steadfast courage. And the, the full name was Dai Yu Jitetsu Koji. And um, uh, that translates as the, la the layman who penetrates the self. And here is Ha Queen's poem. Great and steadfast courage, surpassing all understanding. In the lifeblood of patriarchs, the golden words of Buddhas, it is not lacking in any person. It is not concealed from view. It becomes the morning cloud. It becomes the squall at dusk. It appears as an autumn mist and as the warm spring sun as flawless snow, white jade, or a yard of cold blue frost. Not grudging my eyebrows, I've revealed the essentials. But to get a grasp on them, black heaven, yellow earth. Let me say some words about this poem. Great and steadfast courage, surpassing all understanding, is the lifeblood of the patriarchs. It also is our lifeblood. We're not any different from the patriarchs, the ancestors of Zen. And it's, it's a little bit misleading, this word patriarch, because a number of them were women. For example, Bodhidharma's teacher was a highly celebrated, deeply realized, recognized spiritual teacher who is still revered to this day in the small village in India where she last lived. The golden words of Buddhas, it is not lacking in any person. It is not concealed from view. It becomes the morning cloud, it becomes the squall at dusk. This is our true nature. Those of you who are working on who am I or I faced before my parents were born, consider this deeply. It's the morning mist, it's the evening squall. Who are you? It appears as an autumn mist and as the warm spring sun, as flawless snow white jade or a yard of cold blue frost. Not grudging my eyebrows, I have revealed the, the essentials. It is said that if a teacher teaches falsely, their eyebrows will fall. That's what grudging his eyeballs mean, or his eyebrows means. Great and steadfast courage surpassing all understanding is the lifeblood of patriarchs. The golden words of Buddhas, it is not lacking in any person. In the West, certainly in America in particular, we're taught that we're not good enough. It has something to do with the Puritan ethic. But we are. We are possessed of enormous courage, strength, compassion, and wisdom. And our practice is about unfolding and uncovering that and living it in everything we do or say or think. Great and steadfast courage surpassing all understanding is the lifeblood of patriarchs. The golden words of Buddhas, it is not lacking in any person. It is not concealed from view. It becomes the morning cloud. It becomes the squall at dusk. It appears as an autumn mist and as the warm spring sun, as flawless snow white jade or a yard of cold blue frost. Not grudging my eyebrows, I have revealed the essentials. But to get a grasp on them, black heaven, yellow earth. And he's got a note about black heaven, yellow earth. In the Book of Changes, black and yellow are said to be the colors of heaven and earth. Heaven is black and earth yellow. And then there's an annotation 
He means, hear the sound of one hand. That was Hogwin's favorite breakthrough koan to assign to his students. To a teacher who has done deep enough practice, it's easy to see these amazing positive qualities in everyone. Even when people can't see it in themselves. But have faith. It's there. And as you deepen your practice, as you continue to work, no matter what you encounter, it will be uncovered. Little by little, it'll be uncovered. And this is our work, to uncover it, to live it fully. Thank you for listening. We'll stop now in these cyclical vows.